Thank you for the invitation to the symposium forming the Reformed. I repeat the title because when I was reading the title, I was really happy to see a kind of little grammatical detail giving a kind of dialectic, uh, the active and the passive construction of forming as the active and reformed as the passive in terms of grammar. Maybe this philological interest I have made me thinking of a figure which could help to organize the reflections about this topic. And the figure is the theorist and literature um, scientist, Peter Sondi. Peter Sondi was here at the Freie University, active as a teacher. He established the Institute of Literature Theory and he was a rising star. He was in the 50s when he was 25, publishing a book called The Theory of Trauma, which was seen as that book about trauma theory at the time. And he was as well, when he was teaching at the university, very much engaged in the battlegrounds of engagement and autonomy in relation to the student movement. He was asked to give a statement in a court case at that time, which was held against the members of the so-called Kommune Warn. Fritz Teufel, one of the members, was a student at the Freie University, at least the papers say that he was a student, and Franz Langhans. Franz Langhans and Fritz Teufel were in court because they had published a pamphlet which ended with the sentences, burn, warehouse, burn. At the same time, in Brussels, a department store was set on fire. So the state attorney here in Berlin was seeing them as asking to set department stores on fire here in Berlin and wanted to send them to the prison or they wanted to make an ex state an example about this community one. Sondi, in this case, was asked by the defense if he could come up with a statement about the character of the pamphlet. So what was Sondi doing? Uh, he was asking, is this pamphlet a political pamphlet, a political actionist text, or is it a piece of art? This is a piece which is using fictional categories, all the means of artistic production to produce a piece what can be seen in an aesthetic product. And that was the statement he presented at court. He sees this as a text which cannot be seen as a political pamphlet, which has to be seen as a piece which is using artistic strategies and is more or less an artistic product. In this statement, the dialectic of engagement and autonomy is very clear at work. And you can see how Sondi was positioning himself on the one side as a theorist with his tools working on a text as a phil philologist, and on the other side uh, very much using these things to be engaged. I find this example something helpful to remember when we think about the question how we deal in today's situation with uh, the engagement and autonomy as something which is not excluding each other, which is on a very tricky point, are very intense connected. As I said, in 1971, Peter Sondi committed suicide just shortly before he had to start his position at the University in Zurich. That's why the Neue Zuricher Zeitung published his last or his, one of his last texts, which was a text about the poem Eden, or in German Eden, by Paul Celan. And Sondi was a close friend of uh, Paul Celan and he was very much uh, trying to 
make his poetry accessible, but not in the sense that he was uh, advertising his hermetic and dark language, which most people thought Celan's poetry is speaking. He was trying to see Poland's poetry in the connected, in the woven, in the way how Celan was reflecting reality and how reality was more or less forming this poetical texts, given the perspective of the individual Paul Celan. So in Eden, he exactly did that, that he explained very much what this poem, which when you read it, seems to be quite cryptical, is reflecting a day what Celan spent in Berlin. So Zonti gives in details and with excellence his expertise what Celan is referring to. So he is more or less building a network of association and references what this poetical text is creating. And so when he comes to the end, you understand how he is seeing how literature and theory are engaged in a way of reflecting and designing or making reality possible. The interesting thing starts shortly before the end, when Sondi sets a break and says, OK, what do we know now about this text as a poem, as a gedicht, as a piece of art, when we know all about these references, when we know everything, what this word or this phrase is referring to. He is not saying nothing, but he is more or less saying we don't understand why it is a piece of art, why it is a poem. And this disruptive ending is a point where Sondi, given this example of Ceylon, is putting himself a bit in the tradition of a very romantic thinking that the only criticism of a work of art can be a work of art. That the real critic is an artist and the real criticism can be only an artwork. Which also Walter Benjamin was very much attached to as an idea for criticism. What interested me in this text is again a dialectic what I was trying to refer to of the active and the passive which is not positioning uh, you at the one or on the other side, on the side that all the references, which are interesting and very, very um, fascinating, can explain what made forming a piece. But as well, you cannot just set yourself on the other side, where you just highlight a unique and somehow not understandable access to reality that what the poet has, and that is what it is to creating an artwork. But Sondi tries to see a dialectic at work here, and he was insisting that one or the other side cannot explain or cannot help to get engaged with the artwork itself. And that is a statement which I uh, find made in 1971 still today as a very contemporary one, not only interesting, which is something what I like to go back quite often and to set as an example when we talk about art. Sunday's last text about Paul Ceylon's Eden highlights a kind of two positioning a polar field in which you find yourself very quick if you start to teach at an art academy as an artist. On the one side you have the analysis and on the other side you have the synthesis. The analysis is very helpful to understand and to reflect methods and techniques and to analyze how a piece was made, how a piece is constructed what are the possible functions, the structures, whatever of this piece. But these analyses are not giving you any recipe how to produce 
anything. It just gives you a toolbox which each person or collective needs to start to use for themselves and for their needs. How do you positioning yourself as a teacher in such a process? This is a question what I was facing when I entered the academy in Munich as a teacher. And as I put it uh, in an ironic way, the first week being a teacher at this academy was the longest period what I ever had spent in an art academy. Florian Pumhösel already gave a short uh, impression how teaching at the Munich Academy is organized with the system of classes. And I think he described quite well that you are turned between the activity to form a collective as a productive field for production and as well paying attention to the individual points uh, and interests and helping people to find a way how they positioning themselves. What I found helpful for myself when I remember Sunday's uh, analysis and the way I organize my teaching is the concept of the individual as a medium. The individual as a medium means for me not so much uh, that it is a very unicorn identity what we're speaking about if we call individuals. It is about the idea that we as individuals are composed, as Marx once put it in the Feuerbach thesis, an ensemble of the surroundings, an ensemble of the gesellschaftliche Verhältnisse, the ensembles of the relations, the social relations, and the, the relations we have and we are formed by. So we are formated by a network of activities as well, which we, when we are producing, activate. So an artist today is never working alone, also if he is like a poet sitting at his desk. But in fact, the production of artists are very widespread and collaborative ones as well. In the early 90s, the novelist Neil Stevenson created the term avatar, and it was one of the most successful terms, metaphors, created because Stevenson was a close friend of people working at that time at Apple Company. So they took up Avatar as a helpful tool to create a navigation system where you can identify with as a substitute for you and your activities. So when I talk about the individual as a medium and or as an avatar, then uh, the idea of analysis and instructions and this dialectic of analysis and instructions come in a different way into place than in the teaching as I tell you a method how to do and what to do and I give you the categories what I have and you have to follow them. Mostly I find myself in a position that I have to say I don't know. But I want to create out of this dilemma a productive field. So the avatar and the medium, these are terms which not only as metaphors, also as active tools helping me to design the field, what I'm positioning myself, my activity, while teaching in. In the last years in our academy in Munich, there was an intense discussion about the new study regulation, which also uh, has in mind to think about if the system of classes, how it is organized, is still a contemporary uh, method or is it still something which needs to be reformed. In this uh, discussion, there was also a preamble for the whole study regulations in which some sentences needed to be articulated. What is the goal of the academy? What is the idea what the academy is doing? And it was a statement first presented, which uh, said, we try to educate successful artists. I didn't agree with this statement at all, and I was trying to find a way, how can I articulate what I think an art academy is about? And I must be honest, it is very difficult for me still today to identify this. 
But what it is for sure, it is not to introduce the term success and also a term of a profession as something what in this uh, institution is the most interesting thing you can reach. What I found helpful is the term attitude. Also in the sense, as Harald Seemann put it in his exhibition, when attitudes becomes form, but attitude in a general way as a position from where you can organize your praxis, where you have an idea where you are wanting to head towards to, how you are dealing with reality, which kind of realities you are interested in, and that you have a high knowledge of artistic methods, aesthetic knowledge you can use to deal with. That is maybe in a very vague way the articulation I would have tried to put into sentences. The attitude comes very close with another term I would like as a method to highlight. It is the what if. Liam Gillick was very often using it as a term to describe his own artistic approaches. But the what if is exactly what is the way of fictional thinking. The way how when I go back to Peter Sondi's statement in the court case that he said if somebody is reflecting in artistic or aesthetic strategies about what if, it doesn't mean that he is telling you immediately act, do this and be the political active part in the process. So what Sondi was at that time highlighting, which I think is still important today, that politics and art are extremely linked, but they are not identical. The attitude and the what if, these are the two helpful terms I still uh, thinking about. And an institution as an art academy is that where these two ways of producing these ways of thinking, these ways of being active, that to find attitudes, to articulate attitudes, and to keep the field of what if open is essential because this is a place where you have freedom, freedom and autonomy. I use these two words which are very vague, which are very open for interpretation, I know that, but I don't have other ones at hand right now. And the independence of such a space is more than necessary. Why? When we think about the what if, we think about our ability to fictionalize, the ability for different worlds, the ability of fantasy, let's put it that way. The poet Marcel Bayer was once uh, presenting a text about bird watching in the Gulf War. One of an American soldiers were uh, describing his bird watchings at the war zone. And Marcel Bayer is somebody who is very interested in how people are using language and how these uses of language are opening doors which are closed so far. And one of the ways how people who birdwatch describe the birds is that they have to be accurate. They have to be extremely precise because sometimes they don't know exactly what they are describing. So maybe somebody in the future will pick up this description and can identify something what was at the time when the description was made, made not possible to identify. What I mean, what Marcel Bayer was uh, saying is, we have to be precise because our fantasy is limiting us as well. The framework with our, which we are in in our fantasies is a framework which we want to transgress, but we can maybe transgress us just by being precise because somebody who is outside this framework in the future can identify things because of this precise description which we were not able to see. So the changes of gaze as a possibility, that is something what is very important. And I think an institution which is open, independent, needs to see this as something which is very important as an open field. 
or to put it very shortly, also the institutions has to be organized in a way that it all the time asking for itself and its structures, what if. That's why I chose the image, what you can see right now while I'm talking, of a piece by Mladen Stilinovic, which is called The Shoelace, because better than this image, I can't express what I want to say. Thank you.